When most people think of the early days of World War II, two things come to mind. The Blitzkrieg, where the German army just ran among it to Europe with little to no resistance, and the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, where Japan bombed the caught off guard the United States in a surprise attack. That being said, most people tend to overlook this, but Japan had its own Blitzkrieg, the one where it conquered a good chunk of Asia and humiliated the Western powers. With some people saying that the Japanese conquered more territories than the Germans. But before we get to how the Japanese were able to gain so much, we have to look at why. As while the cause for the Nazi invasion of Europe is more well known, Japan's reasons for conquest is rarely discussed. For the longest time, Japan has been a very isolated nation. For over 200 years, the Japanese islands were cut off from the rest of the world due to the policies of the Tokugawa shogunate. However, in 1853, the United States came in. A U.S. Navy ship under the command of Commodore Matthew Perry came to Japan to try to convince the Japanese to open up their borders. And by convince, I mean he was basically saying, train with us or we will destroy you. Eh, the most American thing I've ever heard. And as you can imagine, the Japanese opened up. Around this time period, Japan saw its Asian neighbors being conquered by Europeans. The British took over India, the French took over Vietnam, the Dutch Indonesia, and even the Americans took over the Philippines from the Spanish. And everyone was just ganging up on poor China. So for Japan, they had two choices, either be colonized or modernized, and they chose the latter. So throughout the latter half of the 19th century, Japan would turn itself from a backwards, feudal society into a modern juggernaut. To give you an idea on how fast the Japanese progressed, imagine if colonial America turned into the modern day US in a time span of 30 years. Okay, I might be exaggerating, but you get the picture. The Japanese would adopt Western styles of clothes, government, and especially military, with the army being trained by the French and the navy by the British. The old samurai ruling class, not happy with the new road Japan was going through, decided to rebel against the new government. But the end were defeated by the newly established army. Gone were the samurai of legends who were replaced by the soldiers of the Imperial Japanese Army. Japan would soon get its first taste of military combat in 1894 when it would go to war with China. The Japanese would end up winning this war as the technologically inferior Chinese were no match against the modern might of Japan and thus Japan managed to get control of Taiwan and Korea. The Japanese colonization of Taiwan and Korea was brutal. Taking a playbook from their western counterparts, the Japanese would enslave the native populace, with them suppressing the native's culture and languages and taking their resources along the way. Japan would also send the most troops out of eight nations to fight against Chinese rebels who would rise up against colonial rule during the Boxer Rebellion. However, Japan would face its true test against Russia. You see, the Russians wanted more control over the Far East, and while Japan was willing to compromise with Russia, with the Japanese allowing them China in exchange for them keeping Korea, the Russians refused. So in 1904, the Japanese went to war with Russia and gave them the most humiliating defeat. To the rest of the world, this was shocking as Japan was the first Asian country to defeat a European superpower. And the second non-white country to do so, with the first being the Ethiopians against the Italians 10 years earlier. This is when Japan has started to be seen as a key player on the world stage. Ten years later, during World War I, Japan would side with the Allied powers and fight against Germany. Here, the Japanese would take key German positions in China and the Pacific Islands, but really didn't do much afterwards. The French did ask them for help the Russians on the Eastern Front, but declined since, after all, they just fought a war with Russia not too long ago. Instead, they would focus expanding their interests in China. However, in 1917, when Russia fell to the Communists, the Allied powers would send groups of soldiers to fight against the Communists during the Russian Civil War. But because most of the Western troops were still fighting against the Germans in Europe, again, Japan would send the most troops to fight the Communists. The reason the Japanese did this is that 1. They wanted to show force to the Western powers, and 2. They wanted to take a huge chunk of Eastern Russia. However, the Japanese's effort during the Russian Civil War failed. In 1919, after the defeat of Germany, the Allies would get together to decide what to do after the war. The Japanese delegation proposed a policy of racial equality among the superpowers, but this was rejected by countries such as the United States, Great Britain, and Australia, for obvious reasons. Not to mention, the Japanese were just flat out ignored and snubbed at the Treaty of Versailles. Despite trying its best, Japan was never seen as an equal among the Western powers, with many seeing the Japanese as an inferior race. Aside from being given a few small islands in the Pacific, the Japanese came there empty-handed. 
humiliated, the Japanese will go on to remember this. Believe it or not, during the 1920s, things were actually rather steady for Japan with a booming economy and a rather democratic government. However, during this time, the military would slowly try to take power. Also around this time period, Japan's population began to boom, thus the government didn't have the materials to sustain it. It also didn't help that Japan was frequently going through rampant natural disasters, such as the Great Kanto Earthquake of 1923. And in 1929, the worldwide Great Depression happened, thus turning the Japanese economy upside down. So taking advantage of the situation, the Japanese military decided it was time to strike. In September 1931, the Japanese army would invade Northeast China, then known as Manchuria, and they would later rename it Manchukuo, a puppet state of Japan. The international community was shocked by this and condemned Japan for its actions. Even the Japanese government chastised the military for this as the military didn't ask them for permission. Because of this, Japan's military decided they needed to take power. Throughout the 1930s, the military would conduct a coup and purge of anyone in the government who wasn't on their side starting with the assassination of Prime Minister Inikai Tsuyoshi in May 1932. Here the Japanese military returned Japan to a somewhat democratic state into a military dictatorship, similar to that of the samurai and shogun of feudal times, promoting right-wing nationalism. Now some of you may ask, how much of the influence did the emperor have in this? And to be honest, I can't really say. Hirohito's role in the Second World War is a highly debated topic even to this day. What some saying he supported the military, what others say he was powerless to stop them. There's too many contradictory sources for both sides, so for this time, I'm gonna leave him out of this one. Despite this, the Emperor's image was still used to promote Japanese supremacy as he was believed to be a descendant of the sun goddess Amaterasu of the Shinto religion. During the same time, Japan would fight a border war with the Soviet Union as they were on the doorstep by trying to invade Mongolia. Unlike the Russo-Japanese War, the Soviets and their Mongolian ally actually proved to be a match for the Japanese and managed to keep them out of Mongolia. Because of this, the Japanese decided it was time to take their attention to the rest of China. So in July 1937, Japan would launch a full-scale invasion of China. Despite the Chinese army outnumbering the Japanese by 2 to 1 and delivering a tough and stubborn defense, in the end, the Japanese managed to overrun them. However, in the conquered territories, the Japanese would conduct a genocide on the Chinese. With the most infamous of these events being the Nanking Massacre, where 300,000 Chinese civilians were slaughtered through the month of December 1937. There was even an incident where an American Navy ship who was rescuing Chinese and American civilians were bombed by the Japanese. Because the US and Japan wasn't at war at times, this angered many people in the United States. Japan paid reparations to the Americans, but it was only a precursor to the things to come. In 1940, Japan would join an alliance with Nazi Germany and Fascist Italy who were also conducting their own forms of conquest as well. This would be known as the infamous Axis Powers. After Germany took over France, Japan would take over the French colony of Indochina, which is now part of modern-day Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Like before, the Western powers chastised Japan for its action with even the United States freezing all trade with Japan until they pulled out of China and Southeast Asia. And for the Japanese, this was the last straw. For the longest time, the Japanese tried to play by the rules of the Western powers, and no matter how much they tried, they were always seen as inferior to them. With them even calling out the West as hypocrites as they used conquest and violence to gain their territories. So Japan decided that the best next strategy was to go to war with Britain and especially the United States. First, the Japanese would scrap their plans to invade the Soviet Union and it would even sign a non-aggression pact with the Russians in April 1941. The irony is that two months later, Japan's ally, Germany, would invade the USSR, who also signed a non-aggression pact with them. Japan would instead focus their attention to the Western colonies in the Pacific after months of preparation, the time came. For the Western powers, while they knew a war with Japan was coming, they really didn't take them seriously. Mainly due to their own racial prejudices, as they saw the Japanese similar to monkeys. Yellow, buck-toothed, slanty-eyed buffoons who couldn't see straight. However, they were in for a nasty surprise. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese would strike. Of course, everyone knows about the attack on Pearl Harbor. The US was caught off guard, many of their ships and planes were destroyed, and thousands of their men killed. The reason the Japanese did this attack is because they would believe that it would stop the Americans from fighting a war with them, as they believed the United States didn't have the stomach to fight them. This was a huge mistake along with two others that they made. 
The other two mistakes is that one, they didn't destroy the oil tankers that were on the island, and two, they didn't sink any of the aircraft carriers which were out of sea at the time. And this would come back to bite them, but that's for later. But for now, let's talk about the other attacks Japan pulled during that day. While the bombs were dropping on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese conduct coordinated attacks on several different western bases and colonies in the Pacific and Asia. The first of these attacks would be on the US territory of Guam, which was rather easy for the Japanese as the Americans didn't punch resistance into it as they didn't really see it as a useful target. The same cannot be said for Wake Island. Like with Pearl Harbor, the Japanese would first bomb the island destroying most of the planes that were on the ground. However, a few of these planes managed to make it off the ground and took down some of the Japanese bombers. The Japanese Navy would launch an attack on the island but surprisingly were pushed back by the American Marines who defended it. With the planes that survived the bombing seeing a good amount of Japanese ships. Because of this, the Japanese were forced to retreat. The Americans were so happy for the first victory in the war that it kind of made them overconfident. With the commander of the Americans, Commander Winfield Cunningham saying, Send us more Japs. And as you can imagine, the Japanese took that personally. You see, while Cunningham requested for more supplies, they never came and the US Navy that defended the island were called back to focus on another battle. So the Japanese decided to attack Wake Island one more time and while the Marines fought hard against the Japanese, in the end there were no match for them and on December 23rd, 1941, the Japanese took over Wake Island. So to Mr. Cunningham, all I can say is... You shouldn't have been talking shit! However, the United States wouldn't be the only country that the Japanese would face during the Pacific War. Also on December 8th, the Japanese would attack the British colony of Hong Kong. Here they would face off against British, Indian, Canadian, and Chinese forces. The Commonwealth troops were outnumbered 4 to 1 and because of that they had to retreat inland, with Indian and Chinese troops covering the rear as of their retreat. But unfortunately for them, they would eventually be overrun by the Japanese. Like their American counterparts on Wake Island, the Commonwealth troops fought hard against the Japanese, but in the end, there were no match for them, and on December 25, 1941, Hong Kong fell. Thailand is an interesting case because it was one of the very few Asian countries that avoided European colonialism, and at the beginning of the war, it declared itself neutral. Though they were trying to get back lost lands in Southeast Asia that was taken from them by the French. Despite this, in order for its invasion plan to work out, the Japanese needed to go through Thailand. And on December 8th, they would invade the country. Even though there was heavy fighting in the south of Thailand, the Thais surrendered within 5 hours. However, the news didn't reach some of the Thai troops and they would continue to fight for another day. Despite this, Thailand would then join the Japanese in an alliance and allowing their troops to pass through the country. Now we move to British controlled Malaysia. The Japanese would invade through Thailand in order to catch the British off guard. However, the British had a brief comeback with the Royal Air Force sinking Japanese transport ships. But the Japanese fought back by sinking a ton of British ships defending the ports, with the most famous one being the sinking of the battleship Prince of Wales and Repulse, which was considered the pride of the British Navy. Despite outnumbering the Japanese, with the British also having fresh Commonwealth troops from India, Australia, New Zealand, and Malaysia, they were under-equipped and ill-prepared as they were still using weapons from the First World War and they had no tanks as all of them were being used to fight the Germans and Italians in Africa. Meanwhile, the Japanese had more tanks and planes to take on the British. However, the Japanese' greatest weapon in Malaysia wouldn't be tanks, but bicycles. Yes, I'm being serious here. I know this looks ridiculous at first, but the Japanese used their bikes to glide through the thick Malaysian jungles. Ironically, rumor has it that because the Japanese had so many bicycles, they were rumbling to the point the British troops from afar thought they had tanks. Still, the British and Commonwealth troops would be forced back down the Malaysian Peninsula until they had one final battle in the city-state of Singapore. The Japanese would constantly bomb the city and finally land the troops on the tiny island. After a week of fighting, the British surrendered. For the British and Commonwealth troops, they lost to an army much smaller than them. It didn't help that after the battle, 40,000 Indian troops would switch sides to fight for the Japanese. The Battle of Malaysia and Singapore was considered to be the worst defeat in British military history. For many, the Netherlands doesn't come to mind for Imperial European powers and yet the Dutch had a colony in Indonesia. Unlike the French whose Asian territories were given up after being conquered by the Nazis, here the Dutch government in exile was set up their base in Indonesia despite their country being under German occupation. Despite this, the Japanese needed Indonesia's rubber and rich oil fields. The Dutch knew that they would have to fight the Japanese soon and like many places in Asia, on December 8, 1941, the Japanese would strike. 
The Japanese Navy would destroy what was little left of the Dutch Navy and would begin to send the troops onto the islands. However, unlike other campaigns, the Japanese would actually use paratroopers to take the Indonesian islands. As usual, while the Japanese were outnumbered compared to the combined efforts of not just the Dutch, but the British, Americans, Australians with most of the fighting done by Indonesian troops, in the end, the Japanese managed to overcome and conquer Indonesia. The Dutch tried to enact a scorched earth policy where they would destroy anything of value to the Japanese. But this kind of backfired as it mostly affected the native Indonesians who needed those resources and was one of the contributing factors to the Indonesian independence movement, but that's a different story there. Now we move westward to Burma, which is modern day Myanmar. Japan's aim was to kick the British out of Burma and move into India. Here the Chinese would help the British in their defense of Burma. However, unlike other times, the Japanese also had help from Thai and Burmese resistance troops. While the troop counts were evenly matched, the Japanese and their allies enacted heavy casualties on the Chinese and British and finally took over the country in May 1942. Now we move our focus back onto the Americans. The Philippines was under the control of the United States after taking it from the Spanish during the war in 1898. And the Japanese decided to take the country for themselves. The Japanese would split their forces into two. One group would take the northern islands while the others would take the south. Unlike the British, the Americans and Filipinos actually had the equipment and numbers to back them up. However, they happened to have a terrible commander. General Douglas MacArthur was the head of the American defenses on the Philippines and because of his leadership, his troops would suffer. During the first 12 hours of the attack, MacArthur did nothing, all the while his troops were attacked with the US Air Force being all but destroyed as the Japanese would easily bomb the ground in planes with the Americans having little to no air support. MacArthur would spread out the American and Filipino troops thinking they can overturn the Japanese, but the exact opposite happened. In order to save face, in March 1942, the US government ordered MacArthur to leave the Philippines, with MacArthur giving his famous I shall return speech. Which is all nice and dandy, but it was his command that got his troops in the situation in the first place. And to add insult to injury, MacArthur was awarded the Medal of Honor, the United States military's highest award. Abandoned by their leader, the American and Filipino soldiers were forced to retreat to the Bataan Peninsula, where they would fight until April of 1942. A month later, the last bit of American resistance was stomped out, with the survivors being at the mercy of the Japanese. And thus, the Japanese achieved a great victory. They have beaten not one, not two, but three major Western imperial powers, and only half of East Asia was under their control. And for the Japanese, they would enact a terror onto these lands. For the Allied prisoners who were captured, for the rest of the war, they would be tortured and starved to serve as slave labor for the Japanese war machine. With those who were wounded being killed, and many colonial troops who refused to join the Japanese were either tortured or executed on the spot. But those who would face the brunt of the wrath of the Japanese would be the civilians. At first, the civilians welcomed the Japanese as liberators, as for decades, the citizens of Asia had to deal with the humiliation and racist policies of the Western Imperial powers. However, the Japanese would later prove to be just as bad, if not worse, than the Western powers, as they would enact the same racist policies onto the Asians. With many Asians being slaughtered, raped, looted, and some of the women being sold into sexual slavery. A similar thing happened during the German invasion of the Soviet Union where non-Russian ethnic groups thought the Nazis were there to free them from the communist dictatorship, but instead they just traded one tyrannical government for another. The irony is that the Japanese promoted themselves as the ones who would free Asia from the chains of Western imperialism, but in the end they would become the very thing that they despised. Thank you. Thank you. Titan has freed us. Oh, I wouldn't say free. More like under new management. So as many as you know, this victory was only short-lived as the tide would turn against the Japanese. To quote Admiral Izoroku Yamamoto who planned a Pearl Harbor attack, In the first 6-12 to 12 months of a war with the United States and Great Britain, I will run wild and win victory upon victory. But then, if the war continues after that, I have no expectation of success. And turns out he was right as the Allies would manage to fight back against the Japanese and take as much territory away from them until finally, well, you know how this ends. The reason how Japan got into that situation is simple. Similar to how the Western powers underestimated the Japanese fighting ability, they too underestimated their enemies. The Japanese underestimated the manufacturing power of the United States to outcompete them in ships, planes, and weapons. 
While they also underestimated the sheer amount of colonial and commonwealth troops the British can call upon while they were focusing all their attention on the Germans in Europe. For the longest time, Japan's role during the early stages of World War II has mostly been overlooked. A nation that tried to be like the West only for it to be snubbed which led them to a path of conquest and destruction only for it to happen to them later on. But there was a time when they briefly put their German counterparts to shame. Duke, 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 Duke.